Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the OK Grognard Show. It is Sunday, October 4th, 2020, 10 a.m. Central, in beautiful Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. Sunday, so it's Rules Retrospective Day. We're looking at some stuff from 1st Edition, Advanced Dungeons & Dragons. We tend to... uh, Focus on something from there and just uh, kick it around a little bit. Discuss some of its uh, intricacies, as it were. I just wanted to mention Autumn Revels coming up next weekend. The Virtual Greyhawk Con has been a good time for sure. If you didn't get a chance to watch the Big featured game last night on the Lord Gosumba Twitch channel. It's still over there. You know, it'll be uh, there as a recording. You can catch up with it after the fact. Luke Gygax was playing along with Eric Mona and Anna Meyer and Mike Bridges and Baba Boonski what we're saying now for Chuck Combo. You've got to squeeze that into every recorded show. Steve Chenault was playing with them too. And of course, Jay Scott was running that crazy train wreck. It wasn't a train wreck. I'll tell you what though. It was a really cool adventure and there was a great twist at the end and I'm pretty sure even the person that did the twisting was only aware of it happening after some point in the, after it already started. I don't think that was a a pre-planned twist. Good morning, Death Angel Shadow. How are you doing today? Good to see you. I uh, ran my game yesterday, first edition, insteading with the Giants, kind of a homage to those first Giants adventure modules by Gary back in 78, I want to say. And uh, these pick up two generations later, 45, 50 years after. And the idea is that uh, although the steading and other of the giant strongholds were cleared out by adventurers two generations ago, they've been left to languish and now they're being re-inhabited and a new generation has to deal with the threat. So that's uh, how we started off yesterday's adventure. And... I'm running two more sessions of it for Autumn Revel next week, Saturday and Sunday. That is the uh, 10th and 11th, 1 p.m. Central, five hours, one to six. And then I'm running a uh, couple of sessions of it for Game Hall Con. In November, on Saturday and Sunday at 1 p.m., five hours. And this is a sandbox. So everything that happened yesterday in yesterday's session did happen. Any of those players who sign up for a subsequent session will be able to play that character again. There will be different pre-gens for other players that sign up who hadn't played before so it'll be like a series of strike forces going out and dealing with these giants again over the course of five different game sessions so 20 to 25 hours depending on how you want to count it we take a break in the middle it takes a short while for everyone to uh 
get their pre-gen character and look it over. They're ninth level plus, so it's uh, it's a lot to take in right away, and we don't rush into it. Part of the reason we're doing a five-hour instead of just a four-hour game session is to give people time to acclimate to their characters and to one another because uh, theoretically these characters have adventured with one another for some time. They should not only be familiar with each other's abilities to some degree, but also be comfortable uh, as a bunch of players as if they'd played before with one another. Um, Of course, there is the potential for some of them to come back and play again with their original characters and then other people to step in. And so there'll be this sort of a rotating pool of players over the course of this. I may run another session or two somewhere late in October. Depends how it goes next week. Um, I've got to have enough stuff. It's a mini setting, really. But I have to have enough stuff for people to be able to play multiple times and not run out of material. Not that not that that's really a problem. There's there's more than enough of uh, there's more than enough of this material to last for quite a while. Insteading with the Giants, the whole thing is a big homage. Uh, of course, we're starting off with the idea that the steading is out there and it's being repopulated. Where it goes from there or beyond there, we will uh, we will see. I don't want to give any spoilers, but. I mean, it's six different players, six different characters in each session, so potentially that could be 30 different players. Or, and I I know some people have already signed up for one or the other of the Autumn Revel sessions, so we're definitely going to have some repeats, and we're definitely going to have some new players every time. And it'll be up to the players that are coming back to help bring the others up to speed and make the plans for how things go forward. We'll see. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, It was good to catch up with uh, Nat yesterday, and of course Sarah was playing, and uh, we got to meet uh, Matt Shepard, a fine fine young man who uh, was a stalwart fighter, Big Dave O'Brien. Call him Big Dave, I don't know why. Dave O'Brien's fine fellow. I've, uh, he's been in the game store. Him and his son, of course. And his brother is a regular uh, D&D player, too. I think Dave's over at the uh, Hobby Shop Dungeon Museum today, working on some stuff with Jeff Leeson and uh, Justin Lanasa and whoever else is helping him out today. So stay safe over there, fellas. Get that thing up and running. We're hoping uh, we're hoping much success for uh, for them in that effort over there. It's only a block and a half away from me. I'll probably be over there a fair amount of time. And of course, once they get up and running, they'll have games being run on the regular by the likes of Ernie Gygax and Jim Ward and I think Frank maybe running some games. I know Jeff Leeson will be running some for sure. He's uh, He's probably going to be curating the whole thing, so he'll be uh, he'll be working his butt off, keeping keeping gamers happy all day long. So it'll be a lot of fun. It will be a lot of fun. Oh, you know, uh, ooh, 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 before I get too far past it because I don't want to I do want to thank Jay Scott for setting up Virtual Greyhawk Con and everybody who helped work on it Uh, I wanted to say also hi to and thank you to a new friend Brian who joined us and played the cleric he had some had some uh, connectivity issues later in the game and Bad break. Hopefully you'll get those worked out and come join us again. And Coulter. Coulter. Who uh, was pivotal 
as a magic user casted spells. It was raucous. It was a rock'em sock'em slugfest. Uh, you know, first assault on the steading, and they went in through a way that was going to take them right into the heart, the meat of uh, the population of this. So <laughs> they had their hands full pretty quickly. I mean, they, they got in pretty stealthily, actually. They managed to take out uh, some of the fringe guards and whatnot to get themselves into the meat of it. Well, once they were in, they were beset from almost all sides and barely managed to, uh, <laughs> got very lucky um, getting out so that they could uh, live to fight another day. But a very successful, let's, let's not kid ourselves, it was a very successful battle. Very successful session as far as uh, as far as their overall mission of clearing out the steading and taking care of this renewed giant threat. Ogres and the hill giants and cave bears and brutal. <laughs> brutal. Uh, we'll see how the next group does next Saturday. And of course on Sunday, it'll be picked up again and it'll just be this ongoing multiplayer campaign over uh, three virtual conventions and maybe another session or two in between or afterwards. It'll be a lot of fun. That is all I wanted to say about that. We are definitely going to be getting rid of that. No, nope, we want to keep that. Where are we? Oh, here it is. All right. That's how that works. We're going to be looking at some stuff in the DMG, but first... Because this is about size matters, yes, that's right, I'm putting the accent on the second because this is matters concerning size in first edition rules. And the obvious one to get out of the way, of course, right away when it comes to small, medium, and large is uh, weapon damage. That is where the rubber hits the road for most players, for most games. <clears throat> is where size matters the most is in the amount of damage different weapons can do. So taking a quick look in the player's handbook at some of the differences here, um, in some cases it's going to be less damage, right? Not in a lot of them. Hand axe, 1d6, small or medium, 1d4 against larger than man size. In some cases it's going to be a considerable amount more. Uh, glaive, 2 to 8, 2 to 12. And, well, let's look at some of the more. Longsword, I think, is one of the big ones for uh, most players. 1d8, but 1d12 for larger than man size. Two-handed sword, 1d10, but 3 to 18 for larger than man size. Um, interestingly, when it comes to bell curves, if you're rolling 1d10, you have equal chances. You've got a flat 10% chance of rolling any given number. But if you're rolling 3d6 for 3d18, whoop, playing with the mic, you got that bell curve thing going on, you're likely to be somewhere in the 9 to 12 zone much more often than you're going to get an 18 but also much more often than you're going to get a three so um if you want to average more serious amount of damage um using that two-handed sword against larger opponents definitely uh helps out a lot two to seven that's 1d6 plus one on the trident for small and medium but 3 to 12, 3d4 for larger than man size. Um, there's a number of weapons. A light quarrel, 1 to 4, 1 to 4. Uh, heavy, though, 2 to 5, 2 to 7. So 1d4 plus 1, 1d6 plus 1. 
you're bumping it up a couple of points there with the heavy bolt or quarrel from a crossbow. We had somebody using a scimitar in-game yesterday. So although they were up against larger than man size opponents most of the time, 1d8, either way. So, interesting enough. And, you know, <clears throat> the idea is not to min-max these characters in such a way that we're predicting what they're going to do. That we're telegraphing what type of creatures they're going to run up against. Um, although, Dave's Rictus the Ranger, yep, Ranger Rictus, was, um, was definitely very happy to be up against so many giant class individuals. That's a heap and helping of extra damage for a 9th, 10th, 11th little ranger? Something in there. That's kind of the range of the character levels. And uh, off the top of my head, I can't remember right away. 1d10 for the Hallbird. For small or medium, but 2d6? 2 to 12 for larger than man size. There's a lot of uh, bow stick club, dagger dart, 1d6, 1d6, 1d4, 1d3. But against larger than man size, not 1d6, 1d3, not 1d6, 1d3, not 1d4, 1d3, not 1d3, 1d2 for the dart. A 1 or a 2 damage from a dart against larger than man size. Hardly seems worth throwing, but you can't throw 3, right? So... You just got to make sure they hit all the time. It's just that easy. Use them against the uh, weaker armor class creatures. Hit more often. Of course, uh, anybody who played back in the day knows having one magic user who's out of spells throwing a bunch of darts at your opponent's spellcasters to disrupt their spells is a very useful thing to do. So where are we at? Ties matters. Now we're almost 20 minutes in. But we can run longer because of the uh, seminar. So how many times does size show up as a thing in the Dungeon Master's Guide? What do we got here? First time we got it, it's talking about uh, miniature figures. We can kind of skip over that because it's not really mechanics for the rules. Gems and jewelry. That's right. We're just doing a quick search. And this is talking about gem size. Size matters with gems for sure. <clears throat> the bigger, the better. The higher the value. Often. Not always. I used to love, and here's a little fun <laughs> early gaming tip. I used to love to have essentially valueless gems of great size. And I'm talking about doesn't fit in the mouth of a large sack or your backpack. It's just, it's too big. You got to strap it to the outside. It can be flatter. It doesn't have to be like... A beach ball, right? It can be flatter, more like a platter or a shield. But imagine something that's kind of crystalline, that's been um, beautifully cut so that there are multiple wonderful facets that symmetrically mirror one another in a beautiful way. And there's a... Um, it could be, uh, well, it's always nice if it's translucent and of a color, and then inside there's some sort of flaw that is shaped in a way that's reminiscent. You always hear of, like, uh, star diamonds or gems or whatnot, so that you look inside and you see, like, this starburst pattern. 
Um, what if what if the flaw inside is shaped weirdly, like uh, in the shape of some sort of an animal, the face of a bear, reminiscent of the face of a bear? Suddenly, while well, that gem itself or crystal structure might not have been worth all that much in and of itself, it could be of more value um, because of this flaw. It's just uh, unique, right? And uh, what if it's so wide that it, it's not easy to transport? Suddenly it becomes an issue, and that's kind of fun. Um, it's, it's an annoyance that uh, pays off if you bother to do it, because any damage to this thing, and suddenly, unique or not, if it cracks in half, we've lost uh, we've lost the race on that one, right? So something worth doing. So now we're talking about uh, moving on to another size thing. Armor types of armor and encumbrance. Notice the weight asterisk here assumes human size. So something worth keeping in mind in first edition and early editions. Um, humanocentric. Things revolve around the human as the norm, as the uh, as the uh, guiding star for all of the others. The demi the demi human races, uh, elves, dwarves, all of their pluses and minuses and different abilities are um, expressed as in relation to human. They're not human, they have this. They get a plus because they are better than human as is. A minus because they're not as good as a human in this other thing. So, two, you will find that uh, much of what you see in uh, first edition rule books, DMG in particular, is in relation to human. Now, in this case, they actually spell it out. Assumes human size for the various weights expressed here for the different types of armor. Uh, interesting elfin chain is on this list. So we're assuming a human size for elfin chain. So it's made by an elf, but this is sized for a human. Anywho, where are we at here? Up the top. Oh, okay. We actually have to go down bottom. Weapon types to hit. Adjustment note. Uh, what we were discussing before in regard to damage, also something in regard to hitting. If you allow weapons, if you allow weapon type adjustments to your campaign, it's kind of an optional thing. A lot of people don't do it because it's a lot to keep track of. Please be certain to remember that these adjustments are for weapons versus specific types of armor, not necessarily actual armor class. In most cases... Monsters not wearing armor will not have any weapon type adjustment allowed, as monster armor class in such cases pertain to the size, shape, ability, speed, and or other magical nature of the creature. Not excluded from this, for example, would be an iron golem. However, monsters with horny or bony armor might be classed as plate if you so decide but do so on a case-by-case -case basis naturally monsters wearing armor will be subject to weapon type to hit adjustments so in our player's handbook there's a whole section here weapon types general data and to hit adjustments and i know this is all side note not necessarily size related but uh, battle axe, for example, gets minus uh, minuses against um, heavier armor types like uh, plate mail or plate and shield, banded. Um, whereas against uh, non armor, you get pluses. Just does better against those types of things. Um, other weapons. Footman's Flail pluses against a lot of the heavier armors, a minus against no armor whatsoever. 
So all of these things were something to consider. Let's look at the longsword. Minus two, minus one against armor class two and three um, against uh, armor class nine and ten, which is to say leather or no armor at all, or padded or no armor at all, plus one and then plus two. So armor class two could be achieved by having what um, plus three chainmail so you would have to look over three spots at chainmail to get the correct adjustment for chainmail even though it's armor class two because it's plus three chain you don't get the minus three you only get the minus one for a battle axe something worth remembering anyway backing off that clarifies that section there let's move on um small shields normal size again when they say normal size they're talking man size um large missiles speed and size of the missile negate dexterity considerations so large missiles heard by hurled by a giant or some form of engine, a catapult, trebuchet, uh, where the trajectory, speed, and size of the missile negate dexterity considerations. So this is about armor class adjustments due to dexterity and saying if somebody throws a house at you, it's not the same as being able to be dexterous to dodge a sword blow. So shouldn't come into play. Another important size thing. Location of standard hirelings in general. The various occupations presented here are common to most settlements and of village size and above. Okay, size mentioned there to distinguish the possible origins of various hirelings. Emphasize, skip that. Giant size. Reincarnation. So size affects reincarnation. Regardless of the form of creature in which the character is reincarnated allows the new form to progress as far as possible in characteristics and abilities. For example, a badger character could grow to giant size, have maximum hit points plus bonus points for a high constitution and the intelligence level of its former character. A centaur reincarnation might eventually gain hit dice up to 5, 6, 7, or even 8. And it would be eligible to wear armor and use magic items, etc. So, reincarnation doesn't come up a ton, but it's a high-level spell. It's an alternative to resurrection, raise dead, and other things that take somebody off of the dead list and brings their character back into a campaign. And one of the interesting things about reincarnation, of course, is that it changes your form. You can, uh, those resurrect or the uh, reincarnation tables can include all sorts of forms. As they mention here, certain animals, and of course, a centaur. How great would it be to. Uh, be reincarnated as a centaur. Suddenly I don't need to uh, I don't need to spend all that money on a horse anymore because I am part horse. Now it comes with its own difficulties. Um, one of the rules is that horses can't go in the dungeons. You could bring a mule in with you but horses just won't stand for it. So Part of the reason for that, of course, is that uh, moving around inside of a dungeon for a horse can be incredibly difficult, but I think it's more about their skittishness and not wanting and being able to feel uh, buried as if the weight of the world is coming down on them. If you've ever done any spelunking, if you've ever even done just simple tourist caves like I have at... Uh, Cave of the Mounds, west of here. Um, when you're underground, and it, I think the deepest over there, they let you know when you're on the tour. 
is like 70 feet below ground level. Um, mentally, you feel it. I don't know if you're feeling what you're feeling like you would feel when you go to depths in diving. If uh, there's an actual physical thing or if you're just mentally calculating the fact that you're below ground and there's so much earth above you and what if it collapsed and i don't know maybe there's a sort of a uh they have caves in wisconsin they do cave of the mounds check it out it's a pretty cool little uh thing and there are other ones too i believe but that one's just west of madison and they do tours and it's pretty neat and um so that's to deal with horses, but I don't think that should affect a player character's centaur, right? So let's say you're down in dungeons and stuff as a centaur. Does that make any difference? Well, one of the points here is that creatures can become the largest of their kind so as to make the reincarnated form uh, more playable as a player character if you so are so inclined to uh, DM it that way rather than just say, well, you're not a player character type, so you got to retire. Which is an option. Let's see. I've been down in Carl's Bad Cavern, says Death Angel Shadow. Now that one is huge. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. I've heard about that and seen pictures from within it was like 98 degrees Fahrenheit outside, but 59 degrees Fahrenheit down at the bottom. Now, what is the bottom? Did you get a, did they give you a number for how deep you were underground? That's pretty neat, though, that it changes uh, nearly 40 degrees. It's like 820 feet down. Jeez. Well, if we figure, if we figure, I don't know, if we want to have some 20 and 30 foot high ceilings in some of the rooms, do we got to figure 50, 40, 50 feet per level? Do we then have to consider that you were on level 16 of a dungeon? 820 feet down? I need the side view. I need that cutaway view to... To mark where you were. Maybe you were on. Maybe you were just on 11B. Level 11B. Because there's multiple. Sub levels per level. There's an express elevator. From the top down. No kidding. I wonder how fast that thing goes. Well more so for going up. Oh I see. Yeah you know they need to be able to. Uh, get people out fast. If they have panic attacks I imagine. Um, or if they have any other sort of uh, health emergency, they'll probably have to evac people pretty quickly. So having a uh, having an express elevator is probably a necessity from the sense of a uh, uh, business practice. Huh? Also helps disabled, sure, getting in and getting out if you're in a in a wheelchair because a lot of those. Uh, Imagine a lot of those tunnels and uh, walkways and stuff were, for Carlsbad, are probably old enough that it would be a huge expense to replace them. And some of them are probably not accessible, not very friendly to uh, wheelchairs and other, other devices that might be used by... Individuals who need an assist in uh, a mobility assist, so to speak. Anywho, uh, we are continuing on size. That reference was in reincarnation. We may continue this next week. This uh, We're only on page 45. I wonder how many more references there are. Enlarge is part of the enlarge spell. Um so this one probably comes up a lot with uh, players. Um, I'm not going to go back and read the enlarged spell, but let me read this uh, contextual clarification from the DMG 
that not everybody gets wind of or bothers looking up. In large, all garments and equipment worn by a subject of this spell should be considered to automatically drop off if held by straps and fasteners, otherwise to split away during growth. So it is not possible to squeeze someone to death in their armor by means of an enlarge. Material components possessed will not change size. Coats of mail, however, will be ruined if growth occurs while worn. Note that you can opt to make a target wearing objects an impossible task for an enlarged spell unless the character is actually touched so as to distinguish the creature from objects. So there you go. It's a way of adjudicating the size, the potential size change. Um, I know that some people will say that since magical armor uh, in their campaigns can magically adjust in size, that if you cast an enlarged spell on somebody who's wearing magical armor, while the rest of their garments might rip or shred or fall away, the magical armor itself will resize for the resized individual. Ah, Death Angel Shadow back on this. Uh, I guess parts of it are a thousand feet down, Carlsbad Caverns. But the 820 is where the big hall is. It's a huge room. That's what I think of when I imagine the Underdark. Yeah, right? Like you can get fast food and stuff there. <laughs> well, it is America after all. If you... Just because you're a thousand feet underground doesn't mean you shouldn't be able to get a burger and fries and even have the option for a hot apple pie. Because Merca, we like our fast food. We like it now. I want it yesterday, this waiting in line stuff. Now, as long as it takes to get, and as much as we complain about how long it takes to get, we do reserve the right to take twice as long to then subsequently complain about what we were charged. Time's only a consideration until you have something to say. <laughs> Welcome to America. Anywho, that's the beauty of it. Hey, it's our... We're an entitled bunch here, aren't we? So, we can have the uh, magical armor magically enlarge and reduce when they go up and down and whatnot if you want. You can also adjudicate it such that Unless you actually touch the person, you can't just touch their armor, then the enlarged spell doesn't actually, can't actually target them. It's a DM, DMG consideration. Um, personally, I like the whole idea of uh, casting the enlarge and then the person hulking out and all their stuff tearing away. And in part because... If you are up against a heavily armored fighter and having trouble hitting him, you might prefer to be swinging away at a giant-sized version of that fighter who is then not wearing any armor because all their armor ripped away as they enlarged. Sure, they're bigger, and maybe they pack a bigger wallop when they hit you, but at least now you can hit them because they're armor class 10 in their birthday suit. So there you go. Good times. Enlarged spell. What else we got here? Uh, Autoluke's freezing sphere. The sling stone sized application of the spell has a 40 foot range. Four inch. If hurled by hand. Otherwise, as a sling bullet. All ranges by hand are short. So on and so forth. Um, dragon. 240 to 300, Class E, 
lack of maneuverability. These are uh, adventures in the air. So this is flying speeds due to the large size. So uh, in this case, size matters because the large dragons uh, not as maneuverable as a smaller dragon. The idea that uh, gravity, physics, does affect even fantastical creatures. And uh, just as a smaller bird can twist and turn and fly uh, more erratically than an eagle or a larger bird of prey that can swoop at great speeds, but turning not as uh, agile. So there's another size matters there. Flying mounts, human sized riders. Okay, once again, distinguishing the size norm of being human. Rocks. Amazingly enough, considering their great size, they can plummet straight down like eagles and then arrest their fall by a sudden unfurling of their wings. So they can keep their wings in tight and then unfurl them to end their plummet or dive. Uh, getting into ventures in the water, rowboat. Um, a normal sized crew for a rowboat can be from 1 to 10 or more men, depending on its size. That is suggesting that... Uh, keep cognizant of... Uh, when you throw boats into an adventure, of making mention of how many can fit in them. Of course, if you write one into a adventure that somebody else is going to run, you can certainly make a notation that... Well, the boat doesn't actually just change size, depending on who finds it, that the DM should use their discretion and can feel free to say that the rowboat that is in the adventure is of any size that's useful for the number of players, uh, number of characters and NPCs that they happen to have. If they've got uh, six NPCs and they all have one henchman, so you have 12 characters, make it a rowboat that can handle 12. Or, you could say in such an adventure, make it a rowboat that can handle 11. <laughs> let's, let's make this a decision point. Who's staying behind? Are we squeezing people in and uh, creating a percentage chance that this thing could tip over at some point while you're out on the water? Is it half as big? Must we leave all the henchmen behind and just the six characters move forward? Do we have to make more than one trip? Are we just ferrying across a river or a small lake or some sort of body of water and underground, perhaps? Um, or is this a one-way trip? Are we getting on this boat and following a river that's going to get us out of some danger and we ain't coming back? So draw straws. Who gets to go? Who has to stay? Better use that uh, reverse and large spell and make uh, so-and-so smaller so they can fit on this boat and join us. All sorts of size matters in that scenario there. Good times. Um, again, all of these uh, various uh, ships and uh, watercraft all have a range of sizes. So... Be cognizant of that if you're going to include any of that sort of thing within a game. Depending on the size of the ship, once again, same thing. <laughs> Cap size. <laughs> Underwater adventures. Pearls the size of a man's head. <laughs> this is interesting. Underwater, under the, uh, under, under the section on underwater adventures. Let me just read this little section here. As all readers of fantasy know, the ocean floor is home to numerous ancient submarine civilizations and dark green realms of creatures, half man and half fish. Your players may have heard tales of the mountains of sunken loot that have been collected there over the centuries, of such things as pearls the size of a man's head of beautiful mermaids with green eyes and blue skin, dot, dot, dot. Okay, thanks for that 
image. If they should find some way to investigate these stories, how will you handle it? This section deals with methods for conducting underwater scenarios. Good section to read if you ever want to get into that. A lot of people don't even game in that way. Hey, Prometheus Bound, welcome. <laughs> and um, kind of like we were talking about earlier with the different size gems and the idea of making certain things so big that regardless of their value, they're just very unwieldy and it becomes an adventure in itself, making sure you get these things extracted from where they're found back to a place where you can exchange them for value, whether that's uh, sell them for coins, trade them for other goods that are uh, more readily useful for your adventuring needs, so on and so forth. So pearls, the size of a man's head, how many of those can you fit in a uh, backpack? Did we see, uh, was it a Danny DeVito movie? Six heads in a duffel bag or something like that? So, <laughs> and do they need to be wrapped and secured in a way that uh, if we need to drop this bag to get into combat or something, we, want, we don't want them getting dented or cracked or damaged or chipped in some way that uh, lessens their value. So you definitely want to wrap them up well and be very careful with them. Um, I think I had an adventure one time, speaking of size matters, where the real big treasure in this one situation, deep in a dungeon, was this uh, fantastical, magical pipe organ. Uh, now, the individual pieces, they were like gold pipes, and they were or gold, uh, gold-encrusted pipes, and gem, or gold, gold-plated pipes, and gem-encrusted keyboard, and, you know, all sorts of value there, where you could just kind of chip away at it and pull value out of it. But, as a whole thing, in and of itself, this entire pipe organ if kept intact, was, like, incredibly valuable. But how do you get that out of a dungeon, right? So uh, that made for a lot of fun. Skull and Pants, hey, how you doing? Made it to a stream. Greyhawk game yesterday went very fun, very fun. I talked about that at the top of the show. You'll have to check that out. I made some announcements in regard to... Um, Oh, actually, the pipe organ I put in the... And no, they did not get it out. <laughs> they just smashed it up and took took the gems they could and uh, beat down the pipes so they were flattened and folded them so they could fit them into packs and uh, were basically bringing them back to extract the gold later, sell them off as uh, basically scrap. <laughs> so there you go. But yeah, check out the top of the show later for uh, announcements next weekend and uh, the weekend of Game Hole Con. I'll be running additional uh, sessions of this game, and I'm running it as a sandbox. So people that are that come back and play again can use the same character they used before. People who haven't played in it before will have new pre pre gens to choose from. And if you play in multiple sessions, you'll essentially be revisiting this uh, sandbox location multiple times. So, should be a good time. Definitely, uh, definitely sign up for one or both of the the games next uh, next weekend, Saturday and Sunday for Autumn Revel. And uh, feel free to uh, jump in and sign up for uh, events for Game Hole Con. And uh, there is the possibility that later in the month of October, um, since it's going to be almost a whole month before we get to Game Hall Con, that I'll find a way to run one or two or three other sessions down the line in between. So, at the least, we'll have... I've got five sessions on the books. One yesterday, two next weekend, and two for Game Hall Con. Um... They're all five hours, so we have plenty of time to acclimate to the characters at the beginning. And uh, if we run some more. So we're looking at uh, 20 to 25 hours so far. 
that'll be devoted to the setting a pool of players um assault teams basically going in repeatedly to deal with this giant threat and that's how size matters for that hey look at the clock on the wall we're at 50 minutes which we try to honor the uh the wishes of the convention just to say we got to clean up our table we'll let the next group come in so i will say thank you very much to everybody who's following the channel if you're on here you're not following the channel please do and chime in in the stream chat because that means we can add you to a list Pre prometheus bound death angel channel skull and pants we'll get all of you guys on the list here for the weekly giveaway that we do we love doing the giveaway don't we i just talked to the person who won last week's it's again another badge it is somebody who has previously won a badge so they're getting a second one and actually mike uh that's you're in the same boat right um they are gifting it to a friend of theirs, which, as I say, is exactly how I'd love people to use these if they so desire. If you win more than one badge uh, in subsequent weeks, bring a son, bring a daughter, bring a wife, bring a husband, bring another family member, bring a best friend who games with you, who hasn't been to a virtual convention before and would love to just check it out and see what it's all about. Um... This is exactly how we're doing things. Kefa Paint Studios raiding me? Oh, thank you so much. Very kind of you. With a party of 13. Wow, you're catching me right at the end of it, though. I'm sorry to say, but please do follow the channel and come join me again. As you can see, what's on the screen right now, this is our regular schedule. Today is a rules retrospective. We just finished up. Started at 10 a.m. Central. We do a show every day, 10 a.m., from beautiful Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. We mainly focus on first edition D&D, but, of course, a lot of that stuff is universal and works in other editions, certainly in other RPGs, whether they're medieval fantasy or not. A lot of these concepts transfer over quite easily. On Monday, we do weekly news and announcements. Tuesday, cartography and world building. We talk about campaign stuff on Wednesday. We get GMing tips on Thursday. We're building adventures on Friday. We do GM reviews on Saturday. If you want to check out yesterday's show, feel free. We were looking at uh, Jack the Giant Slayer, the 2013 movie, in anticipation of the event I ran yesterday, an homage to the Giant series of modules from the 70s. And uh, back around to a rules retrospective on Sunday. Hey, if you are catching up with this on YouTube, which I appreciate as well, please do subscribe. Also, give us a thumbs up and maybe make a comment in the comment section if you have some constructive criticism. It always helps to make the show a little better, and I appreciate that. If you're following, do me a favor. Chime in on the stream chat before we shut her down here because we do a weekly giveaway. And all I require is that you're a follower of the show and that you've chimed in on the stream chat because that just makes sure that I know you're not a bot. And that's the all-important thing. No bots, please. Anyway, there you go. Thank you very much. I very much appreciate everybody stopping by. Have a great rest of your virtual Greyhawk Con. And I will see you tomorrow at 10 a.m. Tomorrow and every day from the OK Grognard Show from beautiful Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. Bye-bye.